Hello again. Joining us from Pembrokeshire, the Cabinet Minister and Conservative MP Simon Hart. Simon is the Secretary of State for Wales. In Bristol, the Shadow Housing Secretary, Labour's Thangam Debonair. And with me here in Broadcasting House in London, John Cordwell, the founder of Phones for You. John is a self-made billionaire and philanthropist. And Larissa Kennedy is the President of the National Union of Students. Welcome to you all and welcome to John Dunn in Stockport with our first question. Hi, John. Hello, Gus. If the Brexit negotiations end without a trade deal between the UK and the EU, is this mission accomplished for the government and the Conservative Party? So a big weekend for Brexit. Yes, I've uttered that sentence before, but I think it definitely qualifies this one. Uh, John Cordwell, you were a fan of Brexit. What do you make of where we are? Well, it, it's not surprising, given, given that the Brussels bureaucrats have tried to bully Britain in every way to get unfair com, uh, competitive clauses in the contract between them and us. And the reason I say unfair competitive clauses is because, first of all, there's an £80 billion trade deficit with Europe, which means they're £80 billion better off than we are. So in normal business terms, they should be absolutely desperate to do the deal. But, of course... They've realised that the weakness of our Conservative Party initially and the negotiations that we had and the division between the British public and the division between British MPs means that they've been able to drive a bus through the negotiations. And what is really happening is that they've just stood the ground till the bitter end because they want to impose uh, their bureaucracy on us to stop us competing on our own terms. They say... It's unfair, and the le playing field is not level. Mm -hmm. But what's unfair about it? If it, the EU club is such a wonderful club, why are they worried about Britain being able to trade on their own terms? You donated half a, a million pounds to the Conservative Party before the last election. Um, was that money well spent? How do you think they've handled <laughs> the last 12 months? Well, that's a mixed bag of questions. But I, I, think, I think, firstly, I would say that what Boris Johnson has done on Brexit is amazing. I think being able to try and navigate those stormy waters and get to where we are is an amazing performance, but I just hope we can get across the line and have a sensible trade deal with Europe so that we can carry on being European partners and... And, and use them and keep them as our closest allies and have wonderful mutual trade. If we look at the way that the COVID pandemic from a medical point of view has been handled, I think that's a little bit been a little bit fuddled at times and could have been a lot better. I like the word fuddled and we'll come back to that particular topic. Ray uh, Kirtley in Hull as advertised. Hello, Ray. Hello. Um, 60,000 of our fellow citizens have died so far in the pandemic. Is this really the best country in the world? John Cordwell, you touched on this in your last answer when I asked you about your donation to the Conservative Party and, and that sense of whether it, was, whether it was value for money. You touched on the government's response to the pandemic. Elaborate. Well, I think, first, first of all, some of the messages have been a little bit fuddled at times. But I absolutely agree with Simon that this has been a catastrophic set of circumstances for any government of any persuasion in any country to deal with. Uh, I think there's a few points being missed, though, because the, the analysis um, that you stated there, uh, Chris, mm -hmm. doesn't actually take into account the full picture. And the full picture, and I, I can't take the full picture because I don't have it all, but what I do know is that in the UK in 2019, there was an incredibly mild flu season. And a lot of old and very vulnerable people that would have died in a normal year didn't die. And that's a statistical fact. So then, of course, this pandemic comes along. And a lot of those people were possibly going to die of flu during that time. But COVID got them instead. And I don't know whether that applies to other countries like Spain, Italy and so on. So you've got to really get the full facts to say, has Britain performed badly? But without doubt, it has been, the, I think, the Conservative government have inherited the biggest set of poison chalices you could ever do to have to do Brexit and Covid all in the same year and Boris Johnson to end up with Covid himself. What a horrendous situation. I'm going to Birkenhead next and Rosie. Hi, Rosie. Hello. Our town centre looks like the set of a zombie film. 
The council and our MP are doing their best, but the shops are still closing. The latest being WH Smith, which houses the town's post office. What can be done for towns like ours, where the retail rents are high, many of the people are poor, and we are close to a big city with much better shops? Thank you for that, Rosie. This in the week of the grim news about Debenhams and also Arcadia. John Cordwell, this question has your name written on it. It does, I'm afraid, and that's for all the wrong reasons, because you're absolutely right. The high street is devastated. Um, it's going to be even more devastated and it's going to be a very, very sad state. Of course, some businesses will recover and they'll stay in the high street. So it's not all terrible news, but there's going to be so much accommodation empty. Now, the consequences of that empty accommodation, I don't think people have really thought about because this is not just solely about empty accommodation. This is to do with the collapse of the financial infrastructure of the whole system on the high street. We will have all empty shop units, and those empty shop units will drive down rents. When rents get driven down, all the pension funds out there that affect every man, woman and child in the country are going to be suffering. And this is a real fiasco waiting to happen that nobody's thought of. Now, I don't have an answer to that, but what we certainly need to do is look at government grants that can transform, help developers transform very, very expensive uh, retail space into living accommodation. It won't be all of that uh, accommodation because some of it isn't suitable. Mm -hmm. But to try and breathe some life back into the high street, to bring residential back into the high street so it's a mix of uses where we've got all the high street shops that can survive and people living there. So do we give up then on the idea of the high street as it has always been and accept a sort of mixed economy, as you say, of yes, residential and a few shops? Yeah, the high street will never be what it was. In some places, yes, it will survive where they've got all the right stores. So some high streets will, of course, prosper better than others. But overall in the UK, as a general concept, the high street as it was will never be the same again. But a final thought from a retailer, John Cordwell. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, um, I, think, I think the biggest issue at the moment is that the government are not, not being enough forward thinking on what happens post-pandemic economically. And I've been campaigning for Cordwell Pandemic Recovery, CPR now, for about nine months, right from the beginning, because I could see exactly what was going to happen, which was going to be an economic fiasco for this UK, and actually will be responsible for the demise and the sad loss of more people than the pandemic was. And we've got to fix this. And I've advocated constantly to the government that they need to borrow an extra 500 billion to one trillion pounds which sounds phenomenal but it's achievable borrow that money and then invest in four strategic aims one is the apprenticeship schemes that are world class and to create 500,000 apprenticeships to take the young people off the uh, off off the dole the second one is to invest in infrastructure in the UK in general the third one is a green energy city that then encompasses all aspects of green energy right the way through from renewable energy or any industry that's involved in that. And I would probably make that city some sort of enterprise zone or tax-free zone to, to try and attract the brains from all over the world okay. to relocate on British shores. And the fourth bit is infrastructure investment in general. And to your point, Simon, that's where... In the infrastructure point, we'd start looking how we get the very, very best value. And some of that needs to go into the high street to put the heart back into Britain's cities. Simon, back to you in a, a second. Just to pick you up, uh, John, on that remark a moment ago about the demise of more people. Do you, you mean the economic demise? No, I don't mean that at all. I mean, I think that uh, if you were able to properly calculate these tragic deaths that we've had through corona and properly calculate them and subtract the deaths that would have been from flu and then look at the deaths that we're going to get through suicides, through people who've been delayed going to hospitals for cancer operations. And make no mistake, cancer deaths are going to rise over the next two or three years as a consequence of people being delayed. It's okay. not the health service's fault because they've been flat out busy on this, but it's going to happen. Uh, Simon, borrow a trillion quid, says one of your donors. Uh, another trillion, I think he means, probably, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but... I, I think John makes you know, probably much the same point as I was trying to make, uh, but he probably made it better. A few more uh, which on is the end. 
There is a balance. Yeah, well, there is a balance to be struck, and uh, clearly there is always a judgment about uh, Simon. There isn't think. a balance to be struck if, it, if you don't mind me interrupting. <laughs> there is no balance to be struck because the only balance is that we need to make Britain great again. We need to make us prosper, and any businessman that could borrow at almost zero interest rate yeah, yeah. would do so if they can invest and make businesses successful. So the what balance, we do? If, could, could I just finish this very point and come back? Yeah, of course, of course. Sorry, but if if we now borrow and invest and invest shrewdly and wisely and the government need to bring businessmen in to help them with that create business create industries create wealth <laughs> what we'll actually do is create the wealth for the future and we'll be able to pay that back that debt back if we ever need to and we don't necessarily okay. need to okay but we'll be able I, to pay it back okay what? I'm doing my best I'm doing my best to agree with you okay. on actually most of his <laughs> points. But the balance which I want to say, there has to be, and it's an impossible balance, uh, between economic recovery. Uh, and, and also uh, protection of public health, and mm -hmm. it's uh, and it, it that that line is so narrow, is it's it's almost impossible not to fall off it from time to time. And okay. I just know that of all of the conversations we have in cabinet and elsewhere, it's always about trying to get that balance right. We have to we have to do everything that we can to save lives, but okay. we recognise that a collapsed economy has other awful consequences. Chris, which you we can have do to both. Take into you can do both. I, Let, I've offered the PM several times to come in as an advisor to help with the regeneration of oh, the and UK. Oh, you said no, did he? And, well, I haven't had a response yet. But You're very but welcome been... in the Wales... You're very welcome in the Wales <laughs> office, John. <laughs> you know, there's thousands of civil servants out there, hundreds okay. of MPs. We can do better. Right. That draws a line under my attempts to be a recruitment <laughs> agency. Uh, let's swap Birkenhead for Liverpool and Helen with our next question. Hi, Helen. Hi. Uh, should students receive rebates on their tuition fees and accommodation costs? which take account of reduced time at university and the lack of face-to-face -face teaching. John yeah. Caldwell. OK, for brevity, um, I have said right the way from the beginning that the government should endeavour to make certain that everybody is no worse off post-pandemic than they were pre-pandemic. I have absolute sympathy for Larissa's points, although we do need to quantify it. I think Simon's absolutely right as well. This is such a difficult situation. There's so many complexities and the government are faced with a nightmare, but they do need to help certain classes and, 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 and students that are suffering. 03700 100 444 and Colin Fleetwood is in the Scottish borders. Hi, Colin. Hi. Are the government's frequent pronouncements on reducing greenhouse gas emissions a blueprint for effective action? Or are they just polluting the atmosphere with more hot air? This is Boris Johnson says he wants the UK to cut its greenhouse gas emissions by 68% by the end of the decade compared with levels in 1990. John Cordwell. Of course, climate change is the absolute crucial issue of the day, or it certainly will be post-corona. Um, but... It's more about the whole environment. We are living in a toxic environment, and without doubt, we poison this planet. The tipping point, I've studied this at length, and the tipping point was in the 1970s, and it's a consequence of the population growth and the destruction of our environment that we're all doing. And we doomed. And, and we, we are... I don't want to say doom because it's too pessimistic. We have to fight like fury because it's not about actually climate change. It's about water shortage. And we will be absolutely desperate for water in the next 10 to 20 years. Our water supplies are evaporating as we speak. And there is not enough water to feed the planet unless we start GMO plant manufacturing which is very dangerous because it can potentially affect your DNA so that's not an answer either so we've, we've got a real massive problem what a lot of people don't realize on the climate side uh, piece as well is that when we lose one square meter of ice on the one of the polar ice gaps instead of reflecting 90 percent of the sun's rays back mm -hmm. we're actually absorbing all of those rays into the into the ocean so the ocean warming is may be unstoppable so we have massive challenges and it must be done now thanks for listening on any questions you heard the founder of phones for you the entrepreneur john cordwell the labor mp and shadow housing secretary thangham debonair the conservative mp and secretary of state for wales simon hart and the president of the national union of students larissa kennedy the presenter was chris mason and the producer in bristol camellia sinclair